pastors. I just want to give a, a shout out to the Facebook family. Welcome to Faith Family Church joining us online. I'm Tim Ennis, my wonderful wife Chris. We are just excited to be here. You may be seated this morning in this place. Tell you this, we love your pastors. We've, uh, Pastor Stan and I, we've been walking together in a relationship for over 10 years. And uh, God always knows how to put people in your life at the right time and place. And He's been someone we've been, come on, the Bible says, iron is iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So He's part of, He's one of my sharpeners. And uh, love hanging, we love to dream together. I've uh, been through many transitions and our church was together talking it through. We just made a big transition ourselves this last year. We went from actually a brick and mortar building to mobile. And uh, we're actually meeting at a, at a, at a theater uh, downtown. Uh, we'll meet at this theater and uh, it's been a great time. But uh, he was just at our, our place not too, uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were up in Idaho ministering. And our people love him. Because uh, the man can preach. That's all I know. Uh, and uh, he inspires me every time I hear him. So we, we love him. And uh, I get to kid with him all the time. You know, he has two sons and we have three daughters. <laughs> and so I can help you raise kids, but I can't help you raise sons. I haven't had any. But uh, we're at a different stage in our life. His are little and ours are grown. One's 26, one's 22, getting ready to get married in September. One's 18, getting ready to go off to AM. And, uh, and we, we love the girls. And I have a wonderful wife, Chris, with me today. She pastors the church with me uh, for 33 years. We've been running this race. People yeah. yeah. ask me how to get someone like her. Well, I met her at 12 and didn't let go. <laughs> and uh, and been hanging on ever since. And uh, we've had a great ride and just loving life and loving Jesus. And loving being here, you guys, again, are amazing. Enjoy uh, preaching to you today. Uh, I, want, I want to share with you a message on living beyond self. Living beyond self. God has so much more. I said God has so much more. He does. Wherever you are right now, whatever you're walking through, you may be at your highest place you've ever been in life. You may be at the lowest place you've ever been in life. Let me tell you, God is a beyond kind of God. I said God is a beyond kind of God. Listen, the word beyond itself means to the further side of. To the further side of. Let me understand that God doesn't bring you someplace and that's it. There's a reason he's called the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, the author and the finisher of your faith. So wherever you are, you might be like, we just talked about like this Gehazi with, with, with Elisha. You may feel like, I'm sorry, it's done. Come on, it's not finished. Come on, I know what other people say, but it's not finished to Christ says it is finished. And guess what, he said it is finished on the cross it is done yes. and so now everything that is happening in your life is the process of bringing you into the fullness of Christ within you yes. did you hear me yes. yes it doesn't matter what's going on it doesn't matter what's happening I don't care what's happening let me tell you this God's not worried about our comfort right. <laughs> now we live in a society that's worried about comfort right yes. but God's not that kind of God we 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 like the microwave right <laughs> Could it be done like 30 seconds ago? Could it be, could it be finished already? But, but that's not God. God's not that way because he is working, the Bible says, all things for your good according to his purpose. Well, what's yes. his purpose? Yes. That Jesus shows through you. Amen. That when people see you, they don't see you. They see the Christ living through you. Yes. And we have to understand that because when we do understand that, then we can embrace the process of God within our life because many times what's happening when we're going through it it's really not the problem that's the issue. It's what God's getting out of you that's the issue. Amen. Come on, there's a reason the woman was called the woman with the issue mm. of blood. Yes. But when you come to the blood of Christ, God will cover the issues yes. right. yeah. of your life and bring you to a place that you've 
never been before. I, I don't know where God's taken the Zion and the source there, but I promise you this, that God has a place that you have yet to even begin to see, to endeavor, to begin to understand in your life. Let me tell you this. He took Israel beyond the wilderness. He didn't take them out of Egypt to the wilderness. They got trapped in the wilderness because they couldn't see past the problem. Yes. They couldn't see past their slavery. They couldn't see past their victimization right. that right. had taken place for 400 years. They couldn't see past where they had been stuck all their life. And God said that it's not. He had an 11 days route that he could take them on to get them to the promised land. But they couldn't go 11 days. Why? Because he said, i got to work something out of you. Yes. If I take you 11 day route, you're not going to last because you're not a warrior. You're a slave. The mentality that you're living with, the thought pattern of your life right now would kill you because you cannot even begin to comprehend all that I have for you. So if I take you to the promised land of the giants and the and the things that are ahead of you, you will run back screaming like a little girl. Oh, right. <laughs> or a little boy. Let me be appropriate. <laughs> But he brought them not there to die, but he brought them to take them to the other side. Jesus went beyond the tomb. He didn't just come to the tomb. He didn't just come to, come on, come to, to the earth and die in the tomb. God took him beyond the tomb because the word beyond, beyond means to the other side of something. In our life, he's already ready to take you beyond what you can ask, think, or imagine because of the power of God that's working within you. What is it? What is it in your life? Where are you right now? Let me tell you this. You have not even yet begun to think of where God wants to take you. Did you hear me? You, you have been, sometimes I begin to think about something that God, I say, God, that's, that's so big. It's, it's, I, I, I can't do it. He goes, it's not about you. He says, that's the problem between me and you, Tim. That's an issue that we have at times is that many times you get stuck where you are because you think it's something you have to do when it's not. All you have to do is believe. Have faith in me. Live for me. Let me shape you. Let me make you what you Let me put the people around you that can sustain you and help you to get you where I want you to be. And I will do the work that has to be done. I will get you there and stop looking at you in the mirror and start looking at me in the Word. My Lord. Yeah. Yeah. You see, wherever you are in life right now, God has called you to live beyond that, beyond your fears and your failures, your inadequacies, beyond yourself, your self-focus, your self-interest, your self-made plans, your comfort zone, where you are right now. That is not what God created you for. Mm -hmm. There is something larger within you, something brewing with you, something trying to rise up within you. And many times in your life, it is being put back down because there's a mentality, a thought pattern, something that someone said about you in the past, some event that you've been through, something within your life that every time you begin to rise up, it shuts it down. And God says, I can't take you beyond until you begin to realize i got to take you beyond yourself. Yeah. You see, self is usually the issue within us. What stops us is the power of self. And our life hinders the power of Christ in us. If greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world, then it's not the world's not the problem. Mm. See, many people want to look around and say, well, my daddy was the problem, my parents were the problem, my friends were the problem, the, the world around me was the problem, they did this to me, they did that to me. The, that, no, God said greater seasons in you than that. Yeah. So if that's not the problem, what's the problem, then the problem becomes me. Right. It becomes the self within me that thinks a certain way, acts a certain way, reacts to what has happened in the past, and I get, can't get beyond the past to get into the future of what God has for me. But Christ said this, if I'm going to work out God's beyond plan for you, then you must lay down your life to find my life. Yes. What is life? Life, the Bible describes it this way, life is a road that you're on. It's a road. It's a way of living. It's a pattern that you've developed, that you adhere to every day of your life. Maybe it's a moral code of conduct. Maybe it's a a, 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 a value system, whatever it may be, that's what you live in, and that's the road you travel in, and it traps you, it takes you in that place, and God says, you got to lay that down to take up my upside-down kingdom that I have and begin to operate that way. And you see, we live in a, self, a selfie society, a society that the kingdom of self is the focus, self-interest, self-motivated. It's what have you done for me lately. I, I call it to the childhood syndrome sometimes. And, and what does that mean? It's this. Uh, how many of you have kids? Or have, have had kids. How many were a kid? <laughs> Two of you. I just kind of went on past it. Or just don't want to see what that is. What is that? The, the, you, you have Christmas. You plan for it. You have everything for it. They're excited for it. They give you the list. You get the list. Everything's there. And then Monday comes, Dad, can I have it? Hmm. 
Do you not know what I just did to give you what I gave you? <laughs> what, what have you done for me lately? Mm. You see, to live the life God has for us, we must be willing to reject our own comfort for the good of others. Mm. And you see, it's not easy, and it sure isn't comfortable, but when you deny yourself, God can do so much th more through you. Ever say when you deny yourself? When you deny yourself. See, it's, it's a thing that we struggle with within our life is denying self. Why? Because self screams loud. We are self people, self motivated. We're self focused. We're self interested. It's about self. If nobody takes care of me, who's going to take care of me? I better take care of me. And the thing is this, is that the story of Christ is so much different because self, to be selfless, it means you're more concerned with the needs of others and the wishes of others than, your own, your, than you are your own. You show great, great concern for them. You're willing to give unselfishly to those around you. The etymology, the word study, the word selfless literally means devoted to others' welfare interests and not one's own interests. And so there's this thing within the kingdom of God that comes into our world, into our culture, and it just turns everything upside down from the way we're used to living and, and being and the way the world is motivated. You see, the world measures your greatness by how many people serve you, how many people work for you, how many people are responding to you. But God measures your greatness by, by how many people you serve. Yes. And so to live beyond self, well, we have to realize and understand that, that there is something that has to take place within us. And it requires going through a process. What does that mean? That means God is taking me from the image of self to the image of Christ. The image of what I look like. Come on. To the image of him. And what did Paul say? It's no longer I that live, but it's Christ who lives in me. What I find out many days, I'm still pretty alive. <laughs> Come on, you drive driving me some traffic a while. You'll find out how live you are. Right. <laughs> I didn't mean it the other day. I, 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 we were, I was in my truck and we were driving, and, and there's part of Beltway 8. I was going to the city center area, and, and I don't know why they put that entrance right there where the exit is, and everybody's getting on. And I, I didn't mean to. I didn't see the car, but I guess I cut them off or something like that, and they sped around me and gave me hand signals. And, you know, and I, I just said, love you too. And, you know. <laughs> And self can rise up real fast. First oh, yeah. <laughs> Kings 19, 19 through 21, I want us to look there. It says, Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Saphath, and plowing in a field. So he was at work, and there were 12 teams of oxen in the field. Elisha was playing with the 12 team. Elisha went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulder, and then he walked away. Elisha left his oxen standing there, ran after Elisha, and said to him, First, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, go on back, but think about what I have done to you. So Elisha returned to his oxen, slaughtered them, and he used the wood and the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they ate, all ate the, the meat. Then he went with Elisha as his assistant. Can we pray? Father, I pray today that the word of God, uh, the bread of life, would be broken for each one to partake exactly what they have need of, that we may walk over here fed. Lord, you said in your house there would be meat, meat of the word of God. And so, Lord, today we've come to eat, partake of that meat so we can live. Because you give, you said in your word, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that utters out of your mouth. So, Father, I pray the words that I utter would be actually from the mouth of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. 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 Romans 15, 4 says, such things were written in Scripture long ago to teach us. Now, how many know sometimes you read the Old Testament and you're like, can I just get through Leviticus, please? <laughs> <laughs> Enough of the sacrifices. And the Scripture gives us hope and encouragement, it says, as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. How many of you have something you're waiting on God to fulfill in your life? Amen. Maybe it's a lost loved one to come home, maybe... Uh, it's a marriage to be restored, maybe it's a financial, maybe it's a dream that you've had, maybe it's a business you're trying to launch, whatever that may be within, there's something within, there's a promise that you feel God's given you to be filled. There's things that, Chris and I, this past week, we were just talking about that we've been, you know, walking together in ministry, full-time ministry for over 33 years, and we're like, there's dreams that still haven't been fulfilled yet that we're saying, God, it, we believe this is the season. Amen. We believe this is the season. Yes. Yeah. And there are times I've told him that before, and he goes, no, because you ain't ready. <laughs> I don't like hearing I'm not ready, because I'll, you know, how many of you know, you always think you're ready, right? 
coach put me in. I'm, I'm, I'm put me in, coach. I, I got it. I was born for this, right? And and the thing is, this is that we have to understand and know that that we're in a kingdom of of operation that is upside down from the kingdom of the world. And God and Christ, uh, God sent His Son. He says, I, "I need to send you to Earth because I've been misrepresented." People have a misunderstanding of me. They don't understand the religious society around them has, have, has put, painted me in a light that is not correct. And the only one that can give that off is you. And so he, he, he says in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, he said, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, Paul says. Instead, he gave up. Everybody say he gave up. How many know we like to hold on? He gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Now, I want you to understand something that the story of Elijah, of Elijah and Elisha is very similar to this. Elijah, uh, Elisha is, is minding his own business. He's working. And he's doing pretty well because he has his own oxen. In that day and time, if you didn't own your own ox, you were well off. You know, you were one of the top guys. And he's plowing in his field. He's minding his business. He's doing well. And as he, all of this is going on and all this is happening, Elijah shows up on the scene. He doesn't say anything. He just walks over, hits him with his cloak, and walks off. Now, what the story doesn't tell us, does he even know who Elijah is? I don't know. Maybe he didn't know who he was. Maybe he did. Maybe he's going like, dude, what do you mean to look? <laughs> but the Bible says that in that, when you read the, read the text, he said that, that Elijah walks off. Elisha left the oxen standing there and ran after him. Now, get this. He didn't say anything to him. Elijah, maybe, I don't know, maybe, he said, why, you, you know, he's maybe looking back, why are you running after me? <laughs> and he didn't, but there was something that transpired when his cloak touched him, because the cloak represented the anointing, the, 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 the hand of God that was operating within Elijah's life, and he hits him with that, and he said, he runs after him, he catches him, and he says this, let me, first let me go kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. And Elijah replied to him, go back. One, one passage says this, what do I have to do with you? But think about what I have done to you. And so I want you to get this. Hits him with the cloak. Doesn't say a word. Walks off. Elijah runs after him and says, let me go back and tell everyone goodbye. I'm coming with you. Did he ask him to come with you? No. He didn't say, would you come with me? Would you come and follow? At least Jesus, when he went to the disciples, he said, come and follow me. But there was something in the, in the, in the, uh, the trans, uh, transacted within that touch of the anointing of God on his life that Elijah knew something was going on. Elisha knew something was happening that he wanted to be a part of, and the anointing drew him. The anointing broke the yoke off his life of the mundane, everyday comfort zone that he had lived in. And we would look at it and said, dude, why are, his friends were probably going, what are you doing? You haven't made. You're inheriting your father's stuff. You're, you're, you're applying. You've got it going on. But listen, this is what he does. Not only does he run after him and says, let me tell him go, uh, goodbye. He goes back and he leaves him no road home. Hmm. What does he do? He breaks up the plow into firewood. Wow. Then he takes the ox and he cuts it up and has the Texas barbecue right there on the spot. Come on, serves everybody that was around and says, listen, you're, you're, you're here, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all of this. And it says that he leaves after that, he goes back and he passed around the meat and he ate with them. And then he went with Elijah as his assistant. He wasn't executive pastor. He was assistant. What did that mean then? The Bible literally said the word translated means servant. What did that mean? He cooked his food. He washed his clothes. He took care of him. He did whatever he needed to do, ran his errands. And for four years, you don't even hear, really hear about Elisha. For 10 years, he serves in this capacity. 
Now, how many of you know we would look at that situation and say, now how is he doing better? How is that progress? How is that God's plan for his life? How is that? See, what you have to understand is that there's a process that we go through for God to bring you to where he wants you to be. And one thing in our own life that we've had to do many times, we've had to sit down and actually redefine success according to the word of God. Because even in ministry, there's success that people tell you what success is. But success isn't success unless you're obedient to God. All right. Amen. All right. Amen. Yes. It doesn't matter what other people think it thinks it looks like. Right. And they can call it whatever they want to call it. But at the end of the day, if I know to do right and I don't do it, the Bible says it is sin. Mm -hmm. And if God is telling me to do something within my life and I, I choose to ignore that on my life because people say, no, this is what real success is and mm -hmm. I do that. And I ignore that good. And guess what? One day I stand before the Father and I won't hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Why? Because I've ignored the will of God. That's why he says that we have to give ourselves unto God as our bodies as a living sacrifice, as our reasonable service unto him so that we can know what? Don't be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can know the good, the pleasing, and the perfect will of God. Elijah made a decision, and he, he was serving God, he loved God, he did all these things and all this, but God says, you know, that's good, that's pleasing, but because of where you are, i got something more for you. And I'm sure when Elijah lived, I, I don't even know if he knew what it looked like. I don't even knew, knew what it All he knew is that there was a call, and what you have to understand, there's some things that happen within the process of our life as God brings us to the fulfillment of what he wants for you to go beyond yourself and to the to the, the promises that he has for you, the plan, the hope, and the future. Come on, he doesn't want to hurt and harm you. Right. Right. He wants to give you a hope and a future. So in that, the first thing that happens within his life, everybody say the call. The call. Uh, Elijah went over through his cloak across him, and he walked away. Everybody say it was on him. The Bible says that many are called, but few are chosen. Why is that? You see, God calls us to a beyond kind of life, but we, come on, must choose that life. We must choose him over it. The rich young ruler had this issue. He comes to the Lord and said, how, how, must I, how can I be saved? And he said, listen, do these things and uh, follow these uh, follow the Ten Commandments. He lists them. And he goes, I've done all that since I was a youth. He goes, well, I only see one issue. Go and sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me. And guess what? He, 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 he looks at him. The Bible says he looked at him, dropped his head, and walked away sad. Yes. Now, let me help you out. The issue wasn't that he had stuff. The issue was the stuff had him. Yes. Amen. The stuff had him. He couldn't let go of that. And God was Christ was challenging at the heart of the issue that you think success is your stuff. But so, so stuff is not your success. I am your success. Yes. I am the one. Hallelujah. And so the, the Elijah looks at uh, actually when he replies, he says, "Go back, do what you got to do, but think about what I'm telling you. Think about what you're getting ready to do. Think, everybody say, think about it. Think about it. Have you ever done anything without thinking? Yes. yes. Ever said anything without thinking? Yes. And then you're trying to pull it all back in. <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking. You bought it without thinking, <laughs> and then you realize there was a no bring back, you know, can't, can't return policy, and you stuck with it. Buyer's remorse, right? Yeah. And the, reali the realization, he goes, think about it. Why? Because Jesus said this, count the cost. Count the cost. You don't start building a house and, and, and don't count the cost and get halfway through it and it's left standing there and you look like a fool. You don't go to war with someone that has, you got 10 and they got 20,000 soldiers and without first thinking about, can I beat them? If you can't, you, you, you ask for a treat. He goes, count the cost before you come and do what you're going to do. Count the cost. Why? Because this is the deal. If I talk you into it, come on, I will always have to talk you into it. Every time something happens, every time something's difficult and everything else, I'll, I'll have leaders come and talk to me and they'll say, well, pastor, no, 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 no. I say, okay, well, what, what's God telling you? Well what, you? well, what do you think? It doesn't matter what I think. I think you should do God's will for your life. Yeah, but no, because if I have to tell you what God's will is, I'll help you discover it. I'll help you pray through it. I'll help you find it. I'll help you discern it. I'll help you sense it. 
But at the end of the day, you have to know it's it. Yes. Amen. Because if you don't know it's it, when something difficult happens, mm -hmm. you're gone. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. You're gone. That's right. And he's saying, listen, I don't want you to come and just begin to follow me without thinking this thing through. Right. What is he telling him? It's not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. Because every day you're going to make my bed. Every day you're going to have to wash my clothes. Every day you're going to have to fix my food. Every day you're going to have to run my errands. Every day, nobody's even going to hear about you for four years. You're going to be, come on, in the desert, so to speak, of no man's land. And it's four years before he's be, uh, with him, 10 years. It's until the end of the time we even begin to hear about him. And he goes, I want you to count the cost. I want you to consider. But listen, there is something God has for you. There's something God wants to do within your life. And you have to consider it. And if you don't consider with the right mentality, the right uh, thought process, you'll be just like the children of Israel that got into what they were doing. And every time something happened, they would think about it. And what did they think about? They would think about, come on, the slave master. They would think about where they had been. They would think about the past. And they can't, it would be better off that we were eating onions. Come on, somebody. I don't mind some real ones on a burger or something, but come on. We'd be better off. Come on, at least there were graves in Egypt. We could have just died in Egypt. And God said, I did not bring you out here to die. Right. right. And Moses was always trying to talk them in to go on the next mile, going to the next thing, doing the next thing. Because they had a mentality that they could not get through. But listen, you can think about it all day long. But when you have decided, come on, it's time to stop thinking. It's time to start doing. Yes. He had to take action. Elijah made, a Elijah made a decision to live beyond himself. He was going to something. Come on. He was living for himself at the moment. He had, a, he had a job. He had position. He had everything that he needed. Everything was going on. But everybody said it was all for him. It was all for him. God was looking for men because God had told Elijah, it's time for you to go and tag the next guy to be it. The next generation. You're getting ready to go on. Let me tell you, there's many of you in this place right now. You're older in this generation. I'm not there yet. You're welcome. <laughs> you're, you're, you're older. And the thing is this. Is you have not tagged the next one to take your place. Wow. And you know why? Because many of you have not taken your place. Wow. Right. You've not taken your place in the kingdom. You've not understood your importance to the kingdom of God and expanding the kingdom of God. And you've lived within this place of self. I'm doing good. My business is good. i got money in the bank. I'm getting ready to retire. Life is good. God didn't call us to, call it to, uh, to live a good life. He called us to live his life. Yes, amen. Right. To lay down ours and what we're doing. I don't know what that looks for you. I'm not here to work out your salvation. God says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But at some point in time, you've got to stop thinking about self and start thinking about there's a generation just like in Joshua's time that's growing out that does not know yeah. God. They don't know the works of God. Yeah. Why? Because they have not seen the works of God work through us. Yeah, great. And we have to live at a different level. We have to take that action and go in that place. And now what does that mean? You have to change your attitude to be like Christ. Don't be selfish, Philippians 2, 3, 4 says. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Think of others as better than yourself. Don't look only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. Our greatest, one of our greatest interests we have are millennials. Our millennials are, are those that, that are they're trying to find out, is this God thing real? Not church. Now, there's a lot of people tired of church. I go to church. I'm fourth generation minister. A lot of, a lot of people tired of God. They're not tired of God. Heck, they don't, they're trying to figure out even who God is because they haven't seen him. Wow. How do people see God? Just the same way we see God. So we, the disciples saw God. They saw him through Christ. And when they see us, they should see the power of God working through our life in a way that hasn't before. You see, if we're going to take that action, what does that action look like? Number one, lose life. Yeah. Lose your life to find life. Right. Matthew says, if you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Number two, what do you have to do? You have to be others focused. Mark 9, 35 says this. He sat down, called the 12 disciples over to me, over to himself and said, well, whoever wants to be first must take, take last place and be the servant of everyone else. I mean, this doesn't go with our society around us, does it? Mark 10, 44 through 45. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
Everybody say that's what God came to do. That's what Christ came to do within our life. He came to serve, not to be served, to give his life for a ransom for many. Listen, when we begin to lay down our life for the next generation, for those that are coming up, guess what? You're literally giving your life as a ransom for them. You know what? I would exchange my life for yours. But let me tell you this. This is what happens. It happened in the life of Elijah, but Christ shows it in his life. And God said, I'm going to demonstrate what happens when you really give your life to me. When you really give your life to me, this is what happens. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says this. Therefore, God, everybody say God, God. elevated him. Elevated. Christ did not have to elevate himself. He went to the cross, he died on the cross, but why did he do it? Because he had confidence, he had faith in God that he was able to save him completely and raise him up from the dead. Yes. He said, elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all of the names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why? Because he did the will of the Father. Yes. I said he did the will of the Father. And the question to you and I always is this, as disciples of Christ, I don't even like using the term Christian sometimes because that's so fluid in our society. Yes. But as disciples, followers of Jesus Christ, we're to live our life like him who is willing to lay it all down yeah. for me. We received communion today, a powerful time for me. Because I don't know about you, I wasn't always saved. Yeah, I grew up in a church home, but there came a point in time where I had to find God for me. Yeah. And this is what happened in Elijah's life with Elisha. Elijah, Elijah calls him, and there comes a time and a point that all of a sudden he's trying to get rid of him. He comes to the end, and he goes, you know what, I'm, I'm, my time's coming, i, I got to go, you just stay here, I'm going to go on. And Elisha's like, no, wait, dude. <laughs> I've been here all the time, I'm not leaving. So he's following him from town to town and everything else. And people are going, hey, you know your, you know Elijah's getting ready, your, your master's getting ready to be taken. And yeah, yeah, I know what's going on. And Elijah finally looked at him and said, okay. What do you want? I can't get rid of you. What do you want? I want to encourage you this today. Some of you right now, God is asking you, what do you want? What do you want? What do I want? He said, I'll tell you what I want. I want a double portion. Because when I felt the anointing the first time you touched me, it was amazing. I've seen your life in these past 10 years and the anointing work into your life. I want that double. If you're gonna ask, ask big. Yeah. Right? If you're gonna ask, ask big. Yes. We have not because we ask. And he wasn't motivated by himself. He was motivated why? Because God was raising up the next generation to affect the next generation. He needed a man to take the place of Elijah because Elijah was getting ready to go. And Elisha said, I'm in. There's a passage in the Bible that, 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 that reads like this. Ezekiel says, I looked for a man to stand in the gap to make up the hedge, but I couldn't find anybody, so I had to destroy the land. Will our land around us be destroyed? What is that land? Your family? Your workplace? The place you exist? And you go, will it be destroyed because you wouldn't stand in the gap and make up the hedge and, and let the anointed of God that's in you begin to reside and begin to flow out of you to those around you to affect them? He said, I want that anointing. He said, I'll tell you what, you can have an anointing, but on one condition. When I go up, you have to see me. Let me help you understand that. You have to see me. You don't see me. I see you every day, Elijah. You have to see me. Because at any moment in time, I could be gone, you've got to see me. So guess what? He was so to his head. He didn't look to the left or to the right. Why? Because if God took him that moment, he had to see him. Otherwise, he wasn't going to receive what he was going to receive. He had to see him. He had to be close to him. The other day I received a text message from a young man in his 20s and he was just 
I kind of knew his story already, and he was telling me his story. He said, look, I grew up in Catholic Church. I saw a lot of stuff. It couldn't really push me away from God, but I feel like God's just, I'm on this journey now to really find out who God is, but I was wondering if you could kind of coach me and mentor me in this and help me, but not judge me. I'm like, yeah, I'll have a conversation with you. And we sit down, and we begin to talk, and he began to share with me a minute, <coughs> burger joint. We're sitting there having a conversation. And at the end of the Lord just inspired me to tell him, to share this with him. I, showed, I, told, I told him the story, and I said, uh, out of the Bible, I said, there's, so you're talking about religion, but I want to help you understand relationship. Mm -hmm. Because as long as you keep understanding God through religion, you're always going to have issues with it, because what religion is right. But if you ever come to a relationship where you really see God for you, it changes everything. Yes. Yeah. It changes everything. See, I could try to talk to him and being saved to come from a religious point of view because of what the Bible says, or I can help him discover the relationship that I have with God that nobody can help me have. Which one do you think lasts? And I said, let me just share this for you. Christ called the disciples around him and he told them, he said, listen, I got a question for you. And I'm sure they were on the seat of pants, because you know, there's a question for them. Half the time, they're scratching their head trying to figure it out, right? And he goes, who do people say that I am? And they go, oh, oh I know. Some say Elijah, some say Elisha, some say Elijah. And they went through the opinion. He goes, okay, okay, I know what social media is saying about me, Instagram and all that. I know you're paying attention to all that, but that's not really my question. My question I want to ask is, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Because at the end of the day, he realized this. It doesn't matter what other people say. If they knew who he was. You see, I don't really care what people say about me. But if I look at her and I say, who do you say I'm? And she goes, well, I know you're a man of God. I know this. We're good. I'm good. And Elijah is telling Elisha, if you want to know and receive what I have, you have to see me. And Peter lifts his hand up and he goes, I know. I know. You know, Peter was always doing something. Right? I know Christ might have been concerned about what the heck's he going to say. <laughs> and he goes, you are the son of the living God. And the Bible says this. Jesus makes this comment to him. He said, Peter, you're blessed because you didn't learn this from religion. You didn't learn this from your parents. You didn't learn this from books you read. My Father in heaven has revealed this to you to allow you to see me. And if we're going to see him, we have to pursue him at a level we never have before. You have to get close. And that's what Elijah was telling Elisha. If you want to receive what I have, see me. See what God is doing. Get close to me. And when you see me go up, what I have is going to come down to the next generation. Of what you have. If we will get close to God and pursue him with all we have, what we have will flow down to the next generation. Because when they see us, they're going to see God in yes, us. Amen. They're going to see Christ flowing through us. They're going to see an anointing. Why was there a generation that grew up that did not know God in Joshua's time because they stopped seeing the works of God through the, the generation that was before them. What is happening within your life? Let me tell you, God has something for you to go beyond Amen. that you've never Amen. been before. And I'm here today to I tell you right now, don't stop where you are. I don't care what life's throwing at you. I don't yeah. care what is going on within you. It may be difficult, but let me tell you this. Grab a hold, come on, yeah. of the cloak of God and let that anointing begin to flow through your life one more time Hallelujah. so that you can go into the yes. place that yes. God has created yes. you to go. Hallelujah. Will you bow your heads with me in this place? Father, today, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is true. Father, let us become like you. Let our attitudes be changed. That we stop being selfish and self-focused and we consider those before ourselves. Let us become God-focused and other-focused. Father, there's a place you created for us to go to. 
And there's a process that we must go through. Father, today, you're calling each one of us. So today, we let us make that choice. Let us consider the cost, Father, and say, yes, I am willing to pay the price. I'm willing to go after you, whatever it costs me. I will lay down my life. Lord, I will become that servant to those around me so that in our relationship, they can see you and know you. Ever head bowed in this place, I want to ask this question here today and say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. I've never asked him to forgive me of my sins. If I were to die today, I don't know if I would go to heaven. But the Bible says this, that if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. And he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins when we ask. All you have to do is ask. And if that's you, I want to pray for you. Just slip your hand up and put it down. Anybody at all, I want to pray for you. Anyone here today say, I'm, I'm like that rich young ruler. I, I'm, I'm, I've kind of walked away from God, but God's calling me back. And I, I want to lay it all down. I want to come back to him. If that's you, slip your hand up. I see those hands going up right now. Yeah, just slip them up right now. Right now, just slip them up. I want to pray for each one of you. Just, I want you to stand in this place right now. I want, to, I, want to, I want to pray a prayer across this place for those. Just stand your feet in this place, everyone. Everyone just stand up. If you slipped your hand up right now, I want to pray for you. Say, Father, I give you my life. I come back to you. I consider the cost. And I say, I am willing to lay my life down. Forgive me of all my sins, of focusing on myself and my situations. Today, I pursue you. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my leader. In Jesus' name. Yeah, if you've ever had about, I want to ask this question right now. You're here today and you're walking through some situations that you say, it's time. I know God wants to take me beyond this. It's time. I want to go beyond this. If that's you, I want you to slip your hand up. I want to pray for you. You're walking through some stuff. You're walking through some stuff. I want my wife, Chris, to join me. If you want to slip out of your seat where you are, if you want to come up here, Chris, I just want, we want to pray with you today. Just slip out of your seat. I believe God has another level.
Christ, please. Let's pray.